If you want to be successful at anything, you need to know when to push through the difficult times and when to quit the things that just aren't working for you. That's the core message of Seth Godin's book, The Dip, which teaches you when to give up on an idea and when to persevere with it. It's a short, simple read, and when I read it, it completely changed my outlook on what it means to work hard. Now, a dip will always exist in anything worthwhile, and if you want to succeed, you must learn how to properly cross it, and that's what I'm going to be talking about in today's book club series video, where I break down and share the key points from some of my favorite books. Now, the small percentage of people who have the ability to push through just a little bit longer than most people will get extraordinary results. Similarly, the small majority with the guts to quit early and redirect their concentration onto something new will get huge benefits. In both situations, overcoming difficult circumstances and emerging victorious to become the best in the world is what matters. Now, believe it or not, quitting is often a great strategy, a smart way to manage your life and your career. Sometimes though, quitting is exactly the wrong thing to do. It turns out that there's a pretty simple way to tell the difference and it's all about the surprising value of being the best in the world at what you do. Now, our culture celebrates those who we perceive to be the best at what they do. We provide recognition to the product, the song, the business, or the employee who achieved that number one spot. The rewards are heavily skewed too. So much so, in fact, that it's typical for number one to get 10 times the benefit of number 10 and 100 times the benefit of number 100 due to scarcity. So are you the best in the world? Well, anyone who's considering hiring you, buying from you, voting for you, or following your instructions will want to know how good you are and preferably whether you're the best. Best in the sense of what is best for them right now, given their beliefs and their knowledge. And in the sense of their world, i.e. their own universe and circumstances. To become the best, you need to navigate hard times and know when to push through and when to quit. Now, most people would advise you to persevere no matter what to succeed work hard, try harder, put in more hours, and even train more. If it's a sport or long distance race where your goal is simply to finish, not quitting is great advice. But if all you need to do to succeed is to keep going and not give up, then why do people less motivated or talented than you win? Well, it involves understanding the nuanced difference between quitting something and completely giving up on something. Strategic quitting is the secret of many successful people and companies. Strategic quitting is an active process when no emotion is involved, and the decision is an educated one based on data and factual information. Reactive quitting, or just giving up on the other hand, is at the heart of why many people or businesses never get to the level they want. Reactive quitting is emotional. It's giving up because you're fed up, and this is what most people tend to do. They quit when it gets too hard, and they stick with things against their own happiness when they don't have the energy or will to quit. In his book, Seth Godin uses graphs to visually represent the relationship between effort put into something and the visible results. There are really three potential situations that can be shown in graph form, and they're the dip, the cul-de-sac, and the cliff. So let's look at the dip first. Almost everything in life worth doing is controlled by the dip. At the beginning, when you first start something, it's fun and it's novel and it's new. You could be learning guitar or building a startup or posting content online, or studying for biology exams, it doesn't really matter. It's initially interesting, and you get plenty of great feedback from the people around you. So for example, when I started this YouTube channel, it was really fun seeing the videos go up online, seeing people engage with them, and learning everything from editing to thumbnails and titles. Over the next few days and weeks, the rapid learning you experience keeps you going, and anything new is inherently fun and exciting. Whatever your new thing is, it's easy to stay engaged with it. And then the dip happens. The dip is that long slog between starting something and actually mastering it or seeing exponential results. The dip is a long slog that's actually a shortcut for many because it gets you where you want to go faster than any other method. For example, if you give up, procrastinate, or don't put in the effort during a dip, you won't see the benefits as quickly. And worse is people who give up just before they see the exponential results. The dip is the difference between the easy beginner method and the more useful expert approach where people embrace the challenge and power through. So how is the dip a shortcut to success for those who navigate it correctly? Well, think about what people usually ask about wealth. It's usually, what's the easiest way that I can make money? When actually you should be asking, what's the hard thing that I can do that other people can't? If you talk to a Nobel Prize winner, 
It's this barrier to entry that provides a moat between the best in the world who gets the majority of the rewards and everybody else. So if you're in a dip or a hard place, but the end result gets you to being the best or there's a big reward at the end, you should probably push through. But if not, you're probably not actually in a dip. You might be in our second graph. Now, the second graph that might represent your current situation is called the cul-de-sac, which is French for dead end. And compared to the dip, it's so simple, it hardly even needs a chart. It's a situation where you work and you work and you work and nothing really changes and you get absolutely nowhere. It doesn't get a lot better. It doesn't get a lot worse. It just stays the same. For example, if you're stuck in the same job, doing the same thing without any promotion on the horizon, you can work as hard as you like, but you aren't guaranteed to get any results from your efforts. And even if you do, those results might be negligible rather than exponential. And that's why they're called dead end jobs. There's not a lot to say about the cul-de-sac except to realize that it exists and to embrace the fact that if you find yourself in one, you need to get out of it and fast. That's because a dead end is keeping you from doing something else. It's not just that you aren't progressing, it's that you're actually losing time where you could be focusing your hard work on something that's going to get you the results that you want. The opportunity cost of investing your life in something that's not going to get better is just way too high. The final situation also doesn't really need a graph as it's quite literally a cliff. Smoking is designed to be almost impossible to quit. The longer you do it, the better it feels to continue to smoke. The pain of quitting just gets more and more over time. Seth Godin calls this situation a cliff. It's a situation where you can't quit until you fall off and everything collapses. It's really painful and traumatic and you want to try and avoid this at all costs. So if it's worth doing, there's probably a dip and people often get confused about when to push through something and when you need to quit it. And really it's all about the end result and your willingness to push through the dip itself. For example, any sport has a dip. The difference between a mediocre club player and a world-class player isn't inborn talent, it's the ability to push through the moments where it's easier to quit. Now, a couple of my friends were training to be tennis pros on the junior circuit. They were really good and they won all of their national competitions at doubles and singles as teenagers. At this stage, they practiced regularly and they saw results which kept them excited. When they moved up onto international competitions, one morning they got out onto the practice courts around 7 a.m. To their surprise, they saw Rafa Nadal practicing his serve. He was smashing the ball into the same spot over and over and over again without anyone returning it. When they got a little bit closer, they saw his coaching team and asked them how long he'd been out practicing for. One of the coaches laughed and told them that he just goes out every single day at 4.30 a.m. to practice his surf for three hours before breakfast. And he'd been doing that for the last 10 years. Now, in that moment, my friends took a look back at the power of his serve and its accuracy, and they also looked at each other and they collectively decided that that level of dedication and sacrifice wasn't for them. And if they were to come up against Rafa Nadal, he was so good that even if they were to push through their dip, there was no guarantees of being the best or of getting the results that they were after. The dip creates scarcity and scarcity creates value and the dip is where you grow. Now, if you haven't already realized it, the dip is the secret to your success. It's where winning happens. The people who set out to make it through the dip, the people who invest the time and the energy and sacrifice and the effort to power through, those are the ones who become the best in the world, just like Rafa Nadal. But equally, most people are afraid to quit, as it's easier to be mediocre than it is to confront reality and quit something. Quitting is actually really difficult. It requires you to acknowledge that you're never going to be number one in the world. So it's easier just to put things off, not admit it, settle for mediocrity and continue. My friends could have stuck with playing tennis, practiced intermittently and either been stuck at a low level of the game where they wouldn't have achieved the financial or sporting rewards they wanted, or worse, they could have reached a cliff where they were much older and realized that their dreams were over and they just weren't happy. So in this instance, my friends made a decision based on an analysis of their own desires. They didn't want to get up at 4.30 every day and sacrifice everything to be like Rafa Nadal. And they also analyzed their own ability. They realized that even if they did power through the dip and do this, they wouldn't be able to beat him. But what about if you want to push through that dip? For example, you know that things are tough right now for your startup, but if you push through, you know you can scale up the revenue and IPO or sell it to massively impact your wealth. Well, to understand this, let's look at seven reasons why you might give up during the dip 
and fail to become the best in the world at what you do. You might run out of time and quit. You might run out of money and quit. You might get scared and quit. You might realize that you're not serious about what you're doing and quit. You might lose interest or enthusiasm or settle for being mediocre and quit. You might focus on the short term instead of the long term and quit when the short term gets too hard. Or you might have picked the wrong thing that you want to be the best at because you don't have elements of that talent or you don't enjoy working hard. Now, if you can get through the dip and you can navigate those seven reasons, and if you can keep going when the system is expecting you to stop, you'll achieve extraordinary results. People who make it through the dip are in short supply, so they generate more value. Scarcity equals value. When you're the best in the world, you share the benefits with just a handful of people or organizations or brands. Now, if you're not gonna get to that number one spot, you might as well quit. Our society teaches us that quitting is bad. And generally, this is true, especially if you're in the dip and you need to power through. But it's also okay to quit, sometimes. In fact, it's okay to quit often. You should quit if you're in a cul-de-sac, you should definitely quit if you're facing a cliff, and you should quit if that project you're working on has a dip that isn't worth the reward at the end. Quitting the things that don't go anywhere early is essential if you want to focus your time on the ones that will give you the most results. This is best illustrated in marketing. If you're running ads or a particular marketing campaign to get your business noticed, you'll want to regularly check your marketing spend and the revenue the ad or strategy is generating. In marketing, this is called ROAS or ROAS or return on ad spend. If you put in 10 pounds to a paid Instagram ad and get 100 back, that's an ROAS of 10 and an indicator that ad and strategy is working. On the other hand, if literally no one is clicking on your ad or buying your product and you're spending thousands and thousands, it's time to quit that ad and switch it off. Now, most marketing teams will run hundreds and hundreds of ads and experiment with similar ads, changing everything from the messaging to an image or video or even the color of the buy now button. These are all small experiments and it's expected that some of them will work and a lot won't. The overall strategy of running ads isn't being given up on, we're just ditching tactics that aren't working right now. Strategic quitting is a conscious decision you make based on the choices and the data that you have available to you, just like with ads. If you realize you're at a dead end compared with what you should be investing your time or money in, quitting is not only a reasonable choice, it's actually the smartest one. Failing, on the other hand, means that your dreams are over. Failing happens when you give up, when there are no other options, or when you quit so often that you've used up all your time and your resources. Even worse than failing is coping. Coping is what people do when they try to muddle through. They cope with a bad job or with a difficult task or with being unhappy. The problem with coping is that it never leads to exceptional performance. All coping does is waste your time and misdirect your energy. If the best you can do is to cope, you're better off quitting. And quitting is better than coping because quitting frees you up to excel at something else. Rather than following the advice never give up, a better piece of advice is never give up on something with great long-term potential just because you can't deal with the stress of the current moment. If quitting is going to be a strategic decision that enables you to make smarter choices for your life and your career, then you should outline your quitting strategy before the discomfort sets in. This is what I did when I chose to quit my job as a surgeon. I loved being a doctor, but the opportunity cost of not going full-time working on a tech business was far too great, and I made a decision based on my own circumstances that I'd rather quit my job and take a risk where I'd learn more and challenge myself more than I would if I stayed on the medical career ladder. Now, at this point, you're probably thinking about your own circumstances and thinking, should I quit or should I power through the dip to get to the rewards at the end? Well, luckily, Seth Godin finishes his book, The Dip, by suggesting you ask yourself three key questions if you're considering quitting anything. First off is, am I panicking? Quitting is not the same as panicking. Panic is never premeditated and panic attacks us, it grabs us, and it's in the moment. Quitting when you're panicked is dangerous and expensive. The best quitters, as we've seen, are the ones who decide in advance when they're going to quit. You can always quit later, so wait until you're done panicking to decide, and don't quit when you're emotional. The next thing to ask yourself is, who am I trying to influence? Are you trying to succeed in a particular market or a business? Are you trying to get a job? Are you trying to train a muscle or impress someone? If you're trying to influence just one person, persistence has its limits. If you're trying to influence a market in business, the rules are a little different. 
Sure, some of the people in the market have considered you and even rejected you, but most of the people in the market may never have even heard of you. The market doesn't have just one mind. Different people in the market are seeking different things. For example, if you're not growing on YouTube, you might not be focusing on the correct audience and you might not be working smart enough as well as working hard enough. And the final question to ask yourself is what sort of measurable progress am I making? If you're trying to succeed in a job or a relationship or at a task, you're either moving forward, falling behind, or just standing still. There are only three real choices. To succeed, to get to that light at the end of the tunnel, you've got to make some sort of forward movement, no matter how small it is. If you build habits and progress by 1% each day, those will compound over time and you'll gradually get better. So keep fighting through that dip because the results are just around the corner. Now, hopefully you found this book club video enjoyable. I've got a great video that dives deeply into why I quit medicine and goes through my reasoning, which I'll put up in the end cards. So to absolutely check that out if you're considering making a career switch to see my decision-making process in detail. And do let me know what you're thinking about persevering with and what you're considering quitting in the comments down below, as it can be a little bit nuanced and I'll see if I can help. Right, so thank you so much for watching. Do hit that subscribe button and I'll see you again in the next video. Bye.